Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by our old friend of the show, Rob Cook. Rob, welcome. Well, thank you, Bart. Always a pleasure to have you here. You, uh, you're, you're kind of always on the show in spirit because uh, you come up in probably every third episode just because of the, uh, the legacy you've built for yourself as, a, as an author and um, the founder of the Chicago Drum Show, which is really uh, kind of what we're here to start talking about. We're going to talk about some other stuff later, but um, this is a weird year, right? Oh, man. Yep. Yep. <laughs> And uh, it's reinventing things, that's for sure. When people say they're, they really want to get back to normal and other people, I'm, I'm more in the camp that thinks there will never quite be the same normal again. So, But uh, it, nothing is ever really the same year after year. So it's just we're ready for bigger changes. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, like you said, things are going to be different. Um, and I know you're getting a lot yeah. of questions about this year. It's 2020 about what happened with the the. COVID-19 stuff and your decision and which you, you without a doubt made the correct decision. I mean, legally, I think it would have been, would have been a nightmare. Um, so why don't you just tell us about it? What, what happened this year? Okay. Um, well, I, I want to say a few words first about how we got up to this juncture. Uh, so that's going to go back and I'm not going to, you know, get real deep into the history, but, um, the first, uh, Four years, uh, the the show bounced around a little, and year five was when we first went to the Kane County Fairgrounds in St. Charles, Illinois. Now that's straight west of the Loop, about uh, thirty miles, so it's a little bit farther out and a little bit harder to get to, uh, frankly, than uh, the Odium Expo Center, which is over by the airport. But um, it was it's kind of like renting a VFW hall. Uh, they've, they've had numerous different buildings that we've been in as the show expanded, but basically it was always a, a blank slate. We walk into an empty room and we're expected to leave it the way we found it. Mm-hmm. And, but other than that, we can do whatever we want there. So, yeah. so for, we were there for uh, 20 years from the fifth through the 25th show. We're all there and uh, people get used to that. And, we don't just bill it as the family reunion as a marketing thing. The, the numbers are kind of interesting. When I uh, was working on the show program, which will now be next year's program rather than this year's, yeah. I looked up uh, the, all of the past exhibitor records and so on, and it, it was kind of interesting. There's, there's, we got one exhibitor, uh, Skins and Tins, from Champaign, Illinois, that's been at every show. And, uh, it, so Rebeats and Skins and Tins, uh, this will be the 30th one coming wow. up in 2021. Uh, Joe Chilla from Detroit has been at 28. I think Randy Rainwater has been at 28. But uh, uh, there are a dozen that have been there over 20 years. There are 27 more that have been there 10 years or more and 24 more that have been there four years or more. So it is quite literally, you know, a a gathering of old friends. Uh, And they got used to the the fairgrounds, uh, partly because it's a a neat little town, St. Charles. It's a suburb of Chicago, technically, but it's a it's a small town. It's got a thousand seat historic theater. There's a lot of neat clubs. All the hotels are kind of in one little area, and people get used to staying all at the usual hotel and hanging in the parking lot and uh, yada yada. So there was some blowback uh, when we left. Uh, people weren't some people weren't too happy about leaving it, but we we didn't really uh, after the 25th show have much of a choice. Uh, some of the problems we were running into, the first was space. We were just playing out of room. Mm. Uh, there were two exhibit halls in their, the biggest building, which they, they had just put up about five years before we left. And we managed to, to fill it up completely. Uh, and, uh, one of the two halls was all exhibits. The other half of it, we turned over to the clinic area and, uh, we had to bring our own infrastructure. Again, it was a blank slate. So I had to bring in staging, audio, video, pipe and drape, backdrop, uh, pipe wow. and drape for the booths, uh, all of the cafe and in- infrastructure, which was kind of a second stage area. So that meant another stage, more pipe and drape, audio and video support for the, the cafe, custom tables, hmm. and Jeez. on and on and on. 
But the downside of having half of an exhibit hall uh, full of the clinic area is you have to tell everybody in there to be dead quiet for three hours, <laughs> three clinics yeah. per day. And yeah. when some guys, you know, weren't too happy about, you know, paying for a booth to use for uh, 16 hours and then being told, oh, by the way, six hours, you've got to be quiet. <laughs> At a so drum there was show, always, especially. Yeah, yeah. So there was always a scramble to be in the main room rather yeah. than the other room and, and so on. But um, I, so the number one problem that, that drove us out was uh, space. Hmm. Um, and next was uh, shipping to the show. As the show grew, more and more people wanted to ship, especially some of the corporate exhibitors. And for a while, they shipped to a local UPS store, and we would go over and pick it up in our van, and it grew to where we had to send our truck over. And at the 25th show, we we took a 26-foot Penske with all the show infrastructure, and I needed another 12-foot Penske just for the all the merchandise that had been sent in on pallets and so on. Wow. That, uh, they some exhibitors needed to have taken to the show. Hmm. Uh, so the, the Odeum uh, was closer to the airport, closer to downtown, and it's a, it's a regular uh, expo center. So they were able to accommodate the shipments to the show. They had a separate room upstairs for the clinics, and uh, it, it looked like it solved all of our problems. Uh, so uh, fast forward to this year, what happened? Um, yeah. Things obviously started getting a little bit hairy by the end of February. And beginning of March, I was getting maybe uh, uh, every couple of days, I'd hear from a clinician or an exhibitor or an attendee saying, uh, you know, what's up? Are, are you going to be okay with the show this year? And, and the reply was, well, sure, until we're told, you know, by the, the authorities that we can't do it, we're planning on doing it. Uh, but the, those of, as the days ticked by and, and things were mounting, it was getting more and more tense and I was getting more and more of those. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised that I hadn't heard from one exhibitor about a cancellation. Huh, but that's interesting. Uh, my, my son, one of my uh, main consorts and uh, inspiration really, and he's, he's, did the uh, con concession area at the, the show from when he was about uh, nine years old or so. Well, he's stuck in Nairobi. He works for a division of the World Bank. And, oh, wow. and he was kind of worried, pointing out to me that even if legally it was okay, he was concerned because from what they're saying about high-risk individuals, I'm up there. I'm almost 70. Mm -hmm. I've had some heart issues. And, <laughs> so, and, and he was his travel had been uh, forbidden by his employer. He wasn't going to be able to make it back. And he pretty much made me promise, you know, let's pull the plug on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to just say it's canceled. I, I think it's really important that, sure. uh, to announce not only that the show isn't going to happen at a certain time, but what's, what is going to happen. I felt it was really important that we look at it as a postponement of the 30th show rather than a cancellation. Gotcha. And so uh, March 20th, that's a Friday, I believe, I called the Odium to let them know I was thinking about pulling the plug because at their website, all of the events up through May 1st already had notices saying that by direct the directive of the governor of Illinois and the health department, this event has been uh, canceled. And they, mm. everything up to May 1st at that point had I uh, had that uh, notice. So I called the ODM to see if there was somebody they could refer me to at the state to discuss it in terms of a prognosis for May 15th and what what the ODM's policy would be and if I could guarantee that week, the same usual weekend for 2021, et cetera. And uh, they told me that... Uh, they were in the same boat as everybody else. They couldn't tell me anything definite, but they understood if I needed to cancel. As far as the date for the 2021, uh, my contact needed to check with ownership of the Odium before he could uh, give me the okay. 
So I asked him to let me know by Monday because I felt things were moving pretty fast and I really needed to make a decision by the next Monday. Well, uh, Monday came and I got my first exhibitor cancellation. Mm. And by this time, again, things were, the pressure was growing and I could see that in the next few hours, uh, I envisioned things just spiraling out of control. Three or four yeah. people cancel, word gets around that they have canceled. So, and I still hadn't heard from the Odeon. So I looked around at other venues, other expo centers, and unfortunately, the, the kind of features that I mentioned that the Odeon offers are generally only found in corporate type settings, uh, pretty mm -hmm. expensive settings. And that's why PASIC and NAM charge so much for a booth because it's, it's a lot more if you're, if you're paying corporate rates. Yeah. Uh, the Odeon was, was relatively inexpensive. It, it enabled us to keep the exhibitor rates reasonable and so on. So uh, I, I looked around at other venues, and then I thought, well, there's always the fairgrounds. People were happy there. It might be a good backup. I, I called the fairgrounds. They had a contract to me within about 20 minutes. The, the dates were open, so I, I went ahead with it. Hmm. Uh, it, it turns out uh, later in the day, someone from the Odeon with their hair on fire called us to, to say, what in the world's going on? We just saw on social media that you've moved. <laughs> and I explained what had happened and they said, oh, that's a misunderstanding. We meant we had to check with ownership before we could guarantee that your contract could be rolled over in your deposit and so on. So uh, we may have had a misbehavior communication and a misunderstanding, but uh, the call had already been made. I yeah. uh, uh, Another thing I wanted to do was let everybody know at the same time. Nobody wants to be the last to know. And so there had to be several announcements, one for the clinicians, one for my staff, one for the exhibitors, one for the prepaid exhibitors, explaining all the options that you know, the prepaid exhibitors were given the option of rolling their payment over to the next year and uh, uh, having a bit of a savings if they do that to thank them, et cetera. So uh, all those announcements had already gone out. And uh, so we, we left it as a return to Kane County. Uh, the Some of the issues with Kane County remain. It's still in the same place, obviously, which is farther from the airport and farther from downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, I no longer have the infrastructure and to allow all of the exhibitors to have a space. It, it just wouldn't work to have the clinic area. And I don't have all that uh, infrastructure anymore. Anyhow, it would have all had to been uh, leased or... Uh, borrowed or whatever and and trucked down so uh the show is going to be a little different it's going to be kind of a throwback show uh there will be no clinics there is a large conference room on the second level that we were using as a master classroom and also some presentations and that's going to be called the break room and there's going to be not formal events, but it's going to be kind of zoned like in two hour intervals. And we're going to have, it's going to be like a meet and greet. There's mm. going to be some drum kits up there and it'll give uh, people like Kofi Baker an opportunity who was, he, he was really disappointed that he uh, couldn't do his clinic this year. Yeah, uh, He's endorsing uh, WFL three drums so we're going to have Kofi and B3 and a drum set up there for a couple hours each day. And you can go up and hang with Kofi. And there's not going to be a formal timed, you know, clinic type presentation. But it'll, it'll be more like a meet and greet than a hang. And the same with uh, Jim Catalano and probably Gary Astridge and so on. So it'll, there'll be a hangout up there and, and people will go up and, uh, you know, hear some drumming, meet some people and, and so on. The raffle program will still be taking place. There will be a show program, but um, there will not be uh, formal clinics or timed presentations and so on. So uh, that's what's happening. We'll be back in St. Charles. Yeah.
it's nice to hear from the source about what's actually going to happen. And I think the exhibitor thing, it, it is what it is. Um, obviously, you got to make do and it's a weird. I mean, the world is a weird place right now. So um, I, I'm just happy to to uh, that we all have something to look forward to. Anticipation is building already. I should point out that the, the, the one of the very first things I did as soon as those announcements were out was, I, oh, my God, people are going to be contacting me about their space. So I uh, revisited the last layout uh, from the 25th show and uh, came up with a new floor plan and had that done within a matter of hours. And by that night, people were already contacting me saying, I want the same space I had hmm. five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so it started filling in immediately uh, just uh, with people that were contacting me. So yeah. it was like three or four days before I actually put the word out, hey, you can sign up for spaces now. Wow. But it was already, there were probably already 20 or 30 spaces. And of the 170 spaces, I'd say within 72 hours, it was 50% full. And at this point, as I talk to you, there are only seven spaces of the 170 open. Wow. And there are still some corporate uh, folks like uh, Sonar and DW who have been furloughed and aren't even uh, responding to emails or phone calls now. So we'll probably end up uh, locating some of those in the lobby area. There's room for another 10 or 12 spaces there. Yeah. But uh, virtually all of the exhibitors, there are a couple that either uh, didn't confirm or weren't able to confirm yet. Uh, but for the most part, virtually everybody who was on the diagram for 2020 is already on the diagram for 2021. <laughs> Gosh, that's awesome. I'm just very impressed, too, because I think, I mean, you're the guy in multiple, you know, aspects. But it's just funny because it like uh, so I'll be at the show um, like last year. I'll be there with Vincent Leaf from Vitalizer Drums. We're going to be sharing a booth. Um, and it's just funny because like I, I just love how you're the guy who is just, you know, people can reach out to you and get this all set up. And you're just so on top of it. And I feel like everyone feels like. They're not getting, um, I don't know, some like they're not leaving a voicemail and then some strange person calls them back and says, yeah, you can be in this spot. It's very personalized attention, um, probably because you've built all these relationships with people. Um, mm -hmm. So and I know with Vincent's actually been great because he's handled basically all of the like scheduling or, or I should say the, the setting up of the booth and stuff. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm really excited to 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 be there. And, uh, I think we're going to plan something cool for our booth and, and, uh, and be a part of it. And, and on another note, it's really interesting how you said some of the bigger companies are furloughed. Cause I've seen that trying to schedule some, uh, episodes. Um, one in particular, I've been talking to, uh, someone at Minel and he was like, we got to do it after this is over. Cause he, he left his microphone, his USB kind of microphone at his office and he wanted it to have good quality. And he's like, I can't get back in <laughs> my mm. office. So <laughs> kind yeah. of a, a strange turn of events, but I think it'll be great. I'm really looking forward to yeah. it. It's, it's such a centrally located, um, such a well-respected show. Um, and, uh, I think it's going to be awesome. I, I think so. I think, uh, we, we've, We've got a plan and uh, should be a lot less work going into next year. I've already got the custom key made. Actually, I just came today. The key that was cast in the Czech Republic. And we've got some uh, uh, drumstick key rings made for the 30th anniversary show. So uh, I'll still need some new signage and uh, banners and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, the, the goal is to make everyone uh, not only a little better, but a little bit easier to... Uh, uh, do logistically. <laughs> so, yeah. But I, yeah. I think we have a plan. Oh man. I just think it's funny. You could probably just slap some like gaff tape on the zero of 2020 and just like <laughs> Sharpie on a, <laughs> a one. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Cool. Well, um, I, I think this is a good resource now because, um, the plan is, and I'm hoping people are listening to this on either Saturday, May 16th or Sunday, May 17th. Um, because we're recording this, on Friday, May 15th, we just wanted to, this kind of came together very last minute, um, just to give people kind of an update and get a little, 
of the uh, the the vibe of the Chicago show. Um, now, do you have any fun like before we move on to our other topics? Do you have any fun kind of like you know absolute moments of chaos in your thirty years of doing this um, of just <laughs> things that went crazy or or anything Definitely. fun like that? Definitely. The one, like I mentioned that uh, we used to have people shipped to the UPS store. And then as soon as we unloaded my van, I would send somebody in my van over to the UPS store to pick up all the stuff that people had shipped in. Well, it got to be too much for the van. So then we would wait until the truck was unloaded, send somebody over in the truck. Well, it exploded one year and it was a disaster. I mean, my truck was gone for a long time and, and it was almost time. We started at 8 a.m. The exhibitors were planning to get in at noon and the truck wasn't back yet. And when the truck came back, they said that when they got to this UPS store, which is one of these little st- storefronts in a mall, yeah, y- you couldn't see into the store. It was nothing but cardboard. <laughs> and, and they had received several pallets, DW, Pearl, and a couple other companies had sent pallets and the only way then it was one guy working there by himself. So, wow. and, and he was in his mid sixties. So to get the stuff off the truck, off the pallet, they had to cut the plastic, bring on boxes one at a time, <sighs> which meant dozens of boxes that weren't labeled because oh the pallet God. had been labeled. Yeah. So my truck finally gets back and they're calling, they're screaming for me. Like, uh, and I'm used to being called in, you know, five directions at once, but they said, you've got to come over to the truck we can't get this stuff to the booths. And I went over to see what they were talking about. And the 26 foot Penske that we had brought down loaded with the show infrastructure, it wasn't full to the top, but it was full front to back about four feet deep. Mm. And just hundreds of boxes and a lot of them unlabeled or labeled with a corporate name that wasn't the same as the exhibitor name. So there was nobody in the building that could sort that out and, and call which box was going to go where except me. Oh. So, so I had to get the whole staff together, line them up, and, and have them grab boxes one at a time as I took them out of the, the truck and de- told them where it had to go. But that was the last year that and UPS gave up. They they wouldn't talk to me anymore after that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I quit his job. And <laughs> yeah. He said, you can't ship here anymore. Oh, so, boy. so the Jeez. next year I had to, to rent the, uh, a second truck to bring stuff down. But yeah, there's there oh, are some man. surprises now and then with an event like this. <laughs> of course. I mean, doing it for this long, man. What was your... What gave you this idea originally to do the Chicago Drum Show? Like, I mean, obviously you're an author, you've been doing this stuff. I know you do multimedia stuff with Rebeats, but like, what what was the first thought that said, I could maybe do a drum show? I There was no such thought. Uh, it, it was started by a guy named Jack Hutchinson. Oh. He had a, a business called The Drum Hutch. Jack has passed now. But he had a little swap meet, uh, and there were maybe 10 or 12 of us there. I don't know if you'd even call us exhibitors. We were just participants. And it, I thought it was really neat. Uh, I think Joe Chilla was there. Randy and Bunny were there. Uh, Jack Brand from Percussion Express. Uh, Chuck Scalia. And uh, I thought I had a great time. Drove down from Michigan with my van and sold a few books and so on. And uh, The next year, I called Jack about three months before the the date and and to find out what the date for his next get together was. And uh, he said, "Uh, "No, I'm not going to do it. I lost money on the thing. If you you can have my mailing list if you want to do it." And so I thought, "Yeah, geez, I'm not I'm not in any position to do that uh, in Illinois." By the way, it was in Love's Park, uh, Mm. right? not too far from where bunny lives uh so the the second year i i took him up on that i i jack gave me his contacts and um i announced that it was going to take place in my shop in alma michigan so the second show was in alma and i could see that if it was going to grow and and attract uh more attendees and so on that it i really should get back to the chicago area um so it went pretty well in Alma. So the third year, I uh, had a couple of partners, and we put on a, 
uh, show. There were three of us uh, together, and we did it at the Hillside Holiday Inn. And it, it was much bigger. And then it started to look like, hey, yeah, this has taken off. Uh, this, this has possibilities. Um, and the partnership end of it, however, any, any decision that was made, we had to check with the other two partners and yada, yada. And then I kept after them about the date for the, the third show, and they weren't getting back to me. And so I finally decided to go ahead and do the third show by myself. And uh, we, we did it in downtown Chicago. Uh, the DePaul Music Mart uh, was the venue. And I thought that was a great idea because we'd be downtown and more people could get to it. Yeah. And uh, dad would come to the show while mom and the kids went shopping, yada, yada. It was a terrible idea. Uh, the load in and load out was in an alley and with freight elevators and nobody wanted to drive downtown and yada, yada. Yeah. So that's what led to the fourth show uh, or fifth show finally being back at or not back, but out at the Kane County Fairgrounds. So it, it just kind of grew a little bit at a time from from that little swap meet in uh, Love's Park. And then, then it just uh, was out of control. <laughs> yeah, now it's gone. <laughs> now it's gone nuts. Um, no, that's cool to know. And, and I, I agree with, uh, obviously, you'd think in theory it would be really neat to have it in downtown Chicago. But for most people who've been to downtown Chicago, you realize that it's just, I mean, even parking, like if you want to park your car for the day, it's like $50. I mean, it's just yep. yeah. bonkers. So, um, yeah. well, that's great. I mean, I'll never, never forget that that year that it was downtown, uh, Bill Cardwell was, was packing and repacking in the alley and there just wasn't any space to, to do it any other way. But, uh, he called me the next day to say, Oh man, I'm sunk. I took my wife's camcorder. It was packed in the van, but as I was packing and repacking, I had to take it out of the van and I set it down on something <laughs> and, uh, there was no hope, of course, 24 hours later, probably 10 minutes later, it was yeah. already gone, but <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. It, it just was no fun, uh, getting everybody in and out one at a time, uh, in an alley through a freight elevator and all that. No, no, I know it's, uh, it's a big undertaking and, and I think you've, you've kind of, um, I think can be seen as like a, a template for what people should be now that you're really all up and running and, you know. 30 years later, you, you have it down pat. Um, so that's great. This is awesome. So everyone can look forward to that. Um, what are the dates for 2021? It's the 15th and 16th. We were always the weekend between Mother's Day and Memorial Day. Got it. Occasionally leap year puts two weekends in there, but last Got few it. years it's, there's been just one weekend between Mother's Day and Memorial Day. One year it was on Mother's Day. And I was told over and over again by a whole parade of people, okay, we did it this year, but just a heads up, you know, if you do this again, I won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine from this being my first year with a kid, how big of a deal it was for my wife, you know, obviously I'm yeah. sure that'll go down, yeah. but it was like, uh, it felt like her birthday or something. And I'm like, isn't isn't it my, isn't it his job, my son, to be doing this? Obviously, he's eight months old, so he's not doing it. But I'm like, come on. Um, okay, now uh, that's great. Really looking forward to it. Um, we are also going to talk about George Way. You said you had some more information mm -hmm. that you'd like to bring to the table. Yeah, about Mr. Yeah, Way. and uh, I I got to give kudos to Ron Danette, and I'll do that again towards the. Uh, end of this section, but Ron pretty well nailed it. But there are a couple of things I do want to you know, touch on to round it out. And I would encourage people to go back and listen to Ron Danette's uh, George Way podcast yeah. and also uh, Don Famularo's. I'm going to kind of refer to some things there. Uh, sure. Don was, uh, I found really fascinating. But uh, one of the main things with George that I want to make sure to get in is his performance performance situation and his status as a performer and a, a percussionist. Um, like Ron mentioned, he insisted on being a drummer. He was one of these guys, like so many that you've interviewed already and will interview in the future, that 
didn't have any other choice. They can just tell they're a drummer. That's what they're going to do. And uh, that's uh, George was a prototype of that kind of individual. He was forced to take piano lessons. Like Ron said, he was in a very wealthy uh, uh, upscale household. Uh, they forced him to take piano lessons. He always wanted to play drums. His parents wouldn't budge on it. Finally, a friend of the family actually took George and, and helped, bought a small drum for him. It was kind of a toy drum almost. But the, the next step then was George was determined to learn how to play it correctly. Mm. And he asked around and was told that the, the best drum instructor was George B. Stone. Uh, and again, George B. Stone, as opposed to George L. or George Lawrence Stone, mm -hmm. the guy who ended up writing stick control and, and so on, who was about the same age as George. Well, George B. Stone, um, we won't go into his background, but he was a an all-around musician. He, he could play multiple instruments and uh, was a band leader and so on, in addition to uh, building drums. Uh, his main reputation now, of course, is as a, a drum builder of the early days. So the story actually as told by George L. Stone, who remained a lifelong friend of George's, uh, and they, I have files of correspondence, had files of correspondence, Ron Danette has all of that now. Uh, and uh, so according to George L. Stone, young George Way puts on his uniform, he went to a military academy, and he marches with his drum into the, the Stone facility and asks for George B. Stone, the, the uh, best drum teacher in Boston. And at, at the time, George B. Stone was playing poker with his buddies, which he was known to do when he had some free time. And uh, there was a, a musician's union office upstairs, and I, that's where he was playing cards. And this, all of his buddies look at him like, "Well, are you going to be a jerk and tell this kid you don't you don't teach kids, or are you going <laughs> to be nice to him?" Or you know, they were, they were all holding their breath. Yeah. Well, yeah. George B. Stone uh, cut young George Way some slack and went and gave him a lesson and agreed to teach him. And that became George's second home in short order. He became a gopher, a companion for George L. Stone. And one of the GHW catalogs has a picture, and I think I used it in the leady way, of George L. Stone and George Way as uh, young boys uh, with a bunch of the sound effects that the George B. Stone company made. Mm. But uh, I can't say enough about the musicianship and the quality of drumming that George B. Stone was capable of. They talk about him doing a buzz roll that sounded like tearing a piece of paper and being able to play these intricate solos on the dime if somebody held their fingernail on the dime to hold it in place. And then George B. and George L. Stone could play a solo with one of them playing the left stick, the other playing the right stick part Gosh. on that dime. If you can imagine, wow. and he uh, taught a lot of things other than just technique and, and rudiments. Those were important, but he taught total musicianship, uh, the basics of mallet instruments, uh, the, the use of effects and uh, timing, you know, how, how to play with a band, how to, how to accompany uh silent film clips and, you, and uh, supply the special effects, you yada, yada. So uh, uh, fast forward, uh, George was a good student, a natural born talent and devoted and dedicated and became a professional drummer in short order. And he was playing in uh, you know, the vaudeville houses of Boston and uh, that's all detailed in uh, the leady way. Uh, well, a guy showed up uh, and from New York and in Boston and mentioned that he had just left a job in New York that was playing, I don't know, $15 a week or something. Pretty good money for a, a young man. Told mm -hmm. George if he wanted that gig, he could have it. George immediately went to New York 
And uh, this would be probably 1906. He was born in 1891. So he was a young, eh, mid-teens or so when he landed in New York. Now, uh, Dom, I, I loved uh, learning about uh, the statue to George Cohan and so on, the guy who kind of made Broadway in terms yeah. of the home of the musicals. But if you look into the history of Broadway, actually all the vaudeville houses and everything had started as far back as the mid 1800s. And in fact, George Cohen's parents had uh, a vaudeville show. So uh, Cohen grew up in a musical family and uh, there were, there were no movies, obviously no, no uh, Broadway musicals as we know them today as Cohen kind of pioneered. But there were there were a lot of opportunities for a, a gig and drummer, and George played all over New York, including uh, some places uh, near Broadway. And he worked with with people like uh, he worked for William Fox, who ended up putting his name on, of course, you know the Fox Entertainment Empire. Oh wow! Jack Lowe, the, the Lowe Theaters grew out of that uh, uh, lineage. Hmm. Adolf Zucker who founded the Paramount uh, uh, Movie Studios. In fact, years later, uh, George uh, sent uh, a letter to, to Zucker and explained uh, who he was and that he had worked for Zucker back at the Crystal Hall in, in uh, the Broadway region near Times Square and asked him if he could send him an autographed picture because he was one of his first employees. And Zucker... Uh, complied. What Zucker had there, he had had a penny arcade and decided that he would start showing uh, these these silent film clips up on the second level. And everybody told him that's that's stupid. Nobody's going to go and, and it's on the second level to boot. So what he did to draw people up there, he put in a glass staircase and underneath the glass, there was water running. So it was like oh. a waterfall with colored lights on it. Wow. And it drew people up there. And that was one of George's first gigs. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. and, and, and these gigs were not 20-minute uh, gigs. He talks about gigs where he was playing 12 hours a day for seven days a week. Jeez. And uh, there would be... Uh, a piano player and a drummer and the drummer was doing all the effects uh, doing the uh, fire whistles the uh, uh, he said he wore out multiple pairs of knives doing the sword fights and so on. Oh, so, cool. uh, so George's musicianship was still being uh, perfected at this point hmm. and he ended up uh, not staying there and doing the the Broadway musicals as they started coming out, but becoming a road musician. Uh, he went out with uh, a couple of George Cohen shows like, uh, I'm going to blank out on names of them. But anyhow, he became a touring drummer uh, after a few years in New York. And as touring drummers went, George was pretty much at the top of the heap. Uh, and it, he was on his game. And that it led to not not just the touring musical presentations, but uh, gigs like uh, the largest uh, Mississippi showboat that was in operation, the Wonderland, and uh, circus drumming. Uh, circus drumming is a whole other topic. Yeah. Uh, but he he spent several years with uh, the Ringling Brothers, and the big name in circus drumming directors or conductors is a guy named Merle Evans. And uh, George uh, fit the bill for Merle Evans so well, they became lifelong friends. And George would often go out decades later and sit in with the circus band. Merle Evans actually carried a spare uniform with him always in George's size. Hmm. So George was always welcome to come and sit in. Oh, wow. now, circus drumming, if, if that's that's worth looking up if anybody yeah, yeah. really yeah. wants to uh, get an education. Because these guys had to do, you know, and it wasn't just a oompa oompa. They had to do <laughs> these gallops. And, uh, of course, there were 
there was a regular concert before the show began. So there yeah. was a concert band, but they had to do all the cues, uh, um, for the acrobats and everything. It, it kept you on your toes. And, uh, that was, this was something that he shared, uh, as far as a, a background goes with, uh, senior, uh, William F. Ludwig, uh, yeah, that's right. Senior. Uh, he had a background in circus drumming and, uh, there, there were those that said that that's what led him to develop that pedal. He just couldn't play a gallop fast enough with the existing state of the art on a bass drum pedal. So he had to develop his own. But George had a great love for the circus and always would go out and sit in when he had a chance and was welcome to. But, uh, he, uh, did a lot of traveling over those, those few years that he was on the road before he ended up in Edmonton, Alberta and kind of settled down there. And then, uh, you can pick up the story as, as Ron explained it, uh, and that brought him to Leedy. Uh, and I'm going to kind of fast forward because sure. between what I've said with the Leedy sec, Leedy podcast and what, uh, Ron has filled us in on that uh, we've kind of covered that, but I'm going to jump up to 1927 and he's with Leedy as a, di- and they haven't become a division of Khan yet. And I think I mentioned before, John, it's like George always saw 1927 as the point he wanted to get back to. Uh, he was in a company that was independent, that could act quickly, had great customer service. He was in head of marketing and so on. And he would get involved with a couple of other drum companies of his own in the future and work for many other companies. And he would never have that range of options open to him again. Uh, uh, as I, as I read these different proposals that he made to, for, to raise money, uh, sell stock and so on. I, I always have it in my head. Uh, what he's trying to do is get back to where he was in 27. That's so funny. But, um, so anyhow, uh, Leedy and Ludwig and Ludwig merge with Khan in, uh, 29, George makes the move to uh, Elkhart, continues up until the war is kind of displaced. And uh, for a a while, he had his own company running out of his house, basically selling drum heads and a a few other accessories. And single-handedly sold almost as many drum heads as Leedy had the, the previous year. But that led him to a tighter association with uh, Amarocco, uh, uh, American Rawhide sure. in Chicago. So he joined them as an employee, moved to Chicago, and uh, was with them for a year or so. And that wasn't going to be a fulfilling career, just working with the, the Rawhide company doing drum heads. Uh, that led him to Slingerland. He was there maybe a year And again, a lot of companies that needed somebody, they kind of already had uh, their positions filled and they were, if they had an opening, they wanted somebody for that opening. They didn't want somebody to totally remake their company and take charge. So uh, George found himself working for Slingerland and not being able to do marketing and design work and everything. He did design the HH pedal that Slingerland uh, put out and a, and a couple other minor things. But uh, he finally decided to strike out and move to California, start the drum shop. Uh, and by this time, his wife's health was kind of starting to fail. Uh, Elsie got pretty ill. George had to drive her from California back to Edmonton, Alberta, and then back to California again, take up the shop. And uh I have some pictures of that shop. Uh, well, they're in the, the book, The Leedy Way. It's neat as a pin, and, and it's pretty impressive the way it's laid out. And uh, he just didn't take the retail. And I, I was talking to uh, uh, Remo Belly at one point. Uh, Remo was an old friend of George's because he's uh, from the Mishawaka area. So he was a young man and, and met George when George was in Elkhart. And I and Remo had a shop at about the same time that George was going out there. It was called uh, Drum City with Roy Hart. So I asked Remo about George's shop, and 
And uh, Remo kind of shook his head and, and said, well, George was starting to get a little bit past his prime. And, and consider we're at the, the wartime era, the uh, late 40s now. George was born in 1891, so he wasn't a kid anymore. He wasn't getting old, per se, but he kind of had a vision for this shop, and he didn't want it becoming a hangout. They didn't even have chairs out in the main park because they... It, it bugged him that these jitterbuggers would come in and just sit there and, and hang out and so on. Damn and, jitterbuggers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so uh, Remo said that his place, he and Roy's place, was a hangout. People came mm. in to just hang out, see what was going on. More like uh, what people think of as Frank's drum shop in some of these places. Yeah. But George's wasn't like that. It was a, it was a kind of a sterile setting, and you came in and you... You either bought something and or, or left, you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, it was no surprise that you know George didn't succeed at that, and uh, he decided if he was that retail wasn't for him. He wanted to get stay in the drum industry, but he figured he better go back to the Chicago area. The war w- it was now over. He wrote to his old friend uh, senior uh, William F. Ludwig. Uh, and asked him if it didn't just ask him if he had a position. He had a plan. He wrote to Senior and said, "Here's what I want to do. I want to go on the road for for uh, Ludwig and uh, well, WFL at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, here's what I propose. He, he had the whole plan all laid out: how much he was going to get on commission and how much he would have to make to break even, and blah blah blah. And and uh, Ludwig wrote back and said, yeah, okay, that'll work. Um, uh, it, George had also written to Dave Boyer at the uh, con company, let him know he was coming back. And Boyer kind of jumped uh, at the chance to get uh, George back, uh, only in a slightly different capacity. Now he was going to be basically a traveling salesman. Uh, that looked like a better deal. Uh, so George wrote back to Ludwig and said, I'm sorry to do this, but, you know, I, I'm going to go with uh, uh, Khan and, and do Leedy sales. Uh, so uh, that was fine with Ludwig. They didn't really need him, and George had approached them, and they were just trying to accommodate. But there was a very gracious letter that Senior wrote back to, to George saying, best of luck, you know, I'm, I'm sure you'll land on your feet, and we, we wish nothing but the best for you. and you know, welcome back. Mm, that's nice. So uh, then uh, it didn't work out that well. George kind of chafed. Uh, there was some uh, uh, conflicts with uh, the level of customer service and the, the schedule he was asked to perform, but but he stuck with it. And uh, he stayed with uh, Khan until they, uh, they joined uh, Leedy with Ludwig and Ludwig made it into the new division, Leedy and Ludwig. George was in the middle of that. That's been discussed with his knob tension drums and so on. Well, uh, come 1955, and Khan decides to just wash their hands of the drum business altogether. And I think we've gone over that in, in other forums uh, mm-hmm. or other people have talked about it. They sell Ludwig. Uh, Ludwig and Ludwig to the Ludwig family. They sell Leedy to Slingerland, and George is kind of displaced. But he's right there in Elkhart. He's looking at an empty building now that's been used for drum production. So that's when he decides to start uh, his own drum company. Hmm. Uh, he uh, had not made any fortune along the way. Obviously, he had to borrow the money when he moved to California. He was still working on getting that paid off. And uh, you would think that a guy who was in the middle of the drum universe for all these decades, he'd be really rich by now. But it uh, doesn't work out that way for a lot of drummers. So, yeah, tell me so, about it. Uh, so uh, George uh, sold shares in his company and started up, and he had a lot of investors. I think there were 30. We even have you know, lists of the, who, who the investors were and so on. And then uh, 
I'll, I'll defer to Ron's explanation of what happened then. George, since he didn't really own the company outright, was kind of finagled out of it by this uh, guy, George Rashan. So he's displaced uh, by Camco, and he can't use his own name anymore. Uh, he went to work for Rogers briefly, and you'd think he would have learned after working for all these other companies and so on, but uh, he saw it as, a, as an opportunity, and he, he, it was not too far away, and he went to work for uh, Rogers over in Covington. But they pretty much wanted him to you know, organize the warehouse and the, the mm. distribution and so on. They already had a designer. Uh, they already had marketing people and so on. So George wasn't too happy there, decided he'd be better off back in Elkhart and, and another financial setback in the process because he had bought a house there already and it took him years to get out from under that. He rented it out and had a series of bad tenants and mm. yada, yada. But, but anyhow, he moves back and um again time is kind of running out you know now we're up to you know 1960 and remember george was born in 1891 so uh elsie's in his wife is in real bad shape uh so uh george starts his own little uh business to keep busy the ghw drummer supplies and mainly selling accessories and heads and so on like uh ron mentioned uh well uh george when george passes uh the business was left to elsie uh elsie was in very bad health now she was legally blind she moved back to canada be, to be near her sister and they had had one employee an old uh, gentleman named uh, frank reed and so she worked out a deal with frank that he would buy it by the company, but they did that on the QT so it wouldn't alarm suppliers and you yeah. know, put the guy through uh, having to uh, fill out new credit apps and all that. She just had him keep on running it as it was and they were gonna gradually do a transfer of ownership. And, and that's what happened. And uh, Frank Reed ran it until he died. And eventually uh, it, it simply got boarded up. Well, because of the, the sequence of events with Elsie moving back to Canada, George having died, all of George's archives that had been accumulated over the years, his scrapbooks, his files of correspondence with the Stones and uh, all these other people, uh, his catalog collection, his, his instruction books and everything, you know, Elsie wasn't able to take all that back uh, to Canada with her. And it pretty much went into storage. And uh, I, uh, long and boring story how I came across it, but I went down to visit the guy who had become the caretaker of all that. And after several five hour trips to Elkhart and back to, to access the archives and ask this guy all kinds of questions, he finally said, well, make me an offer. I just want to sell all this stuff. So. I bought it all. It was the equivalent of maybe a couple of four drawer filing cabinets of, of mainly documents, but uh, some hardware and parts and so on. And one of the really neat things that's in there as an aside was a keg drum. It's, it's an oak keg hmm. that it, George had made into a snare drum and it has a beverage dispenser inside made out wow. of copper and it had a tap on it. So it was a playable, marching snare drum with a beverage dispenser <laughs> built in with a, a leady name tag on it. And uh, it was in pretty bad shape. But one of the surprises for the 30th anniversary show was to present that drum in all its glory. And Ron Danette has refurbished it for me and has restored it. I think uh, he's even going to make it a functional beverage dispenser again, which will mean coating that <laughs> copper canister with something on the inside to prevent wow. you know, food poisoning and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, I, I, it's kind of a mystery drum because I, I never saw any picture of it, never saw any mention of it by George in any of his uh, uh, letters or anything. But but that drum will be at the uh, the 30th anniversary show in 2021. 
Oh man! And for a long time, I thought I had everything that George left, but it turns out I learned years later that Jim Catalano, uh, the longtime Ludwig employee, ended up with a big box, uh, a case of all of George's instructional books from back from the 1800s and so on, and uh, all of it, George's scrapbooks and a lot of uh, rare catalogs like U.G. Leedy's Genuine Leather. Uh, Leedy catalogs with his name stamped on them. Those all went to Eddie Knight in Elkhart or in South Bend. Uh, but both Eddie and Jim were, were very accommodating in, in making those resources available to me in, as I research, researched uh, uh, George's wife. But, um, so that's the whole story of the, the George Way archives and wow. uh, George's story up right up through Ron Danette. That's fascinating. And if people are listening and they don't really know what we're talking about, um, there's multiple resources right here on this show that you can check out. Rob did an episode. Uh, we did that was pretty early on. We did one called the Leedy Way, which was based on your book, which you referred to about George Way and Leedy. Um, and then more recently, um, I spoke with Ron Danette, who um, obviously does Danette classic drums, but he also does. Um, he now owns George Way drums um, yeah. and now puts out oh, beautiful oh, new I, drums. Yeah, I think I neglected to mention there that uh, uh, about two years ago, right after I finished the Leedy Way, we also were moving and uh, squeezed for space. And I had had it in the back of my mind for, for many years that all of this, these George Way archives, the Leedy sales records, all these letters and everything, which should be go to a museum or something. But by, by this time, Ron was up and going with uh, George Way, and I thought that would be appropriate to make him the caretaker of all this stuff. Absolutely. So I sent him all these big boxes and everything from George's uh, personal writing utensils to uh, all these files of correspondence, uh, hundreds of pictures, a lot of drawings, and, and on and on and on. So it, it was a fitting place for all of that and uh, for Ron did not to be the uh, the caretaker of all things uh, George Way. Yeah, he's doing great stuff, obviously, with, with George's legacy. And, and like I was saying, for people who don't know who George Way is, maybe you're just now getting into listening to drum history and you're just now learning about um, the history of our instrument. George was an absolute visionary icon in the drum world. Um, so go back and check out those episodes um, as well to get more supplemental info um, and learn a little bit more. All right, Rob. Well, um, this has been great. I'm sure you're obviously disappointed that you couldn't do the drum show, but um, I think people are just disappointed all over the world about multiple things being canceled. Um, I was supposed to go to the see the Rolling Stones this summer, and then Rage Against the Machine was playing, and it's just, and then the Chicago show was canceled. <laughs> Everything was just like. At least we're in good company. I mean, the Olympics, uh, oh the, the Tour yeah. de France, uh, yeah. everything. And, and people ask me about delaying it. Well, geez, why don't cancel it? You know, just delay it 90 days or six months. And Oh, man, all the moving parts. Can you imagine? And then, and then have it happen again uh, on top of all the scheduling. I, I think it was better to just, you know, pause for a year and, yeah. and do it right. I think he did the right thing. I was listening to a podcast earlier where they were, it was in March and they were talking about um, how they were like some places they were like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to close down for maybe a week and then we'll reopen. And now we're in <laughs> May and it's like, yeah, you really don't know. And, and here in Cincinnati, things are actually starting to open like this weekend for outdoor seating or something. And we'll see what happens. So yeah. Yeah. Well, stay safe, man. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. I appreciate you being on the show and uh, I will, I'll talk to you before then, but I'll see you in uh, Chicago in 2021. Yeah. Thanks, Bart. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.